in this video I'm going to take the same line drawing and add hatching to it three times. In the first two I'll use hatching techniques that I commonly see used in drawings but which don't help create a helpful overall effect in the finished drawing. In the third example I'll apply the hatching lines the way I personally would choose to do it and explain why and you can be the judge as to which technique is the most effective. And as an added bonus when I do the third example I'll also point out the difference between shade and shadow and how they affect our drawing and particularly our hatching. So if you haven't seen my whole video on that subject you can have a quick summary and example of it towards the end of this one. G'day I'm Stephen Travers let's go. So we'll get our line drawing done in a quick 30 second sketch of a part of a church in Zurich and we'll use this same line work to try three different versions of hatchwork. Now in the end hatchwork is a very individual thing there is no right or wrong way but it's working out the best way to apply the hatchwork so that we each get the effect the finished result in our drawing that we want. So let's consider these. Our first example that I often see in drawings is straight out hatching where the lines only go in the one direction. It's often applied with a light feathery touch and regardless of what surface it's been applied to, whether it's a surface facing us, going away from us, whether it's straight or curved, the angle of this line is always the same. Sometimes it's applied to multiple surfaces at once, sometimes not. One advantage of this approach is that it never overpowers the original line work of the drawing and it does give us a sense of what's in sunlight and that always gives a nice pop of three dimensions to our object. But what it does tend to do is because it's often applied over multiple planes in our object it tends to flatten everything into one plane and because this looks much the same as this Visually it doesn't help us get any sense of distance. But let's look at our second method commonly seen in hatchwork. And this second one is a cross hatching example called cross hatching because our hatching lines cross. So in our second example we have cross hatching but otherwise it's a fairly similar approach and style to the hatching one. It shares some of the same strengths and weaknesses. It creates a nice three-dimensional pop with the sunlight standing out. The extra line in fact increases the contrast between the light and the shaded areas so that's quite effective. But it, we also have this same flattening effect that we saw earlier. This style of cross hatching always to me looks as though a net has been held up in front of our object or possibly even thrown over the top of it. And while cross hatching at 45 degree angles is a nice way to create a tone effect. I feel it's often not a very good way to apply that tone then onto a three dimensional object unless we're looking directly at it because it does give a very front on feel. But unlike in our earlier hatching there are places where because of the darker shade here additional cross hatching lines have been placed and also on this entrance roofing to give a darker effect. Vertical lines have also been added to a dense cross hatching down here to make the doorway look darker still which helps to give a sense of anchoring the building but also the drawing down in this bottom section. So in the next example I'll hatch this drawing the way I would do it if I were doing a quick drawing of this church. For our third cross hatching example I've used the sort of approach I would take myself if I were just drawing this scene for myself. I didn't take any more care, I drew my lines with the same briskness as I did in the first two examples but because there are more lines it did take me longer probably three to four times as long but that still was only about between 10 and 15 minutes. So I'll complete this and then we'll have a look at this and I'll explain why I made these choices. So in this third example I use the approach I use when I'm cross hatching which is that I try to suggest something of the underlying shape, the underlying form of the object that I'm applying the hatching over the top of. So for instance with these two long windows here the shadow that was caught 
in these deep recesses, I applied the hatch in here with the sort of lines that I thought would apply to the perspective. So this being the perspective angle that these lines are following, and eye level is going to be here, and so these lines would have become horizontal if in fact these windows had continued down to about here. So I've tried to match where the perspective angle would be if these lines were actually carved into the wall. And that helps give a sense of the perspective that we don't get when we just do a line at any angle. Or when we do the same blanket pattern over the whole space. Because down this side wall it's a straight line, my preference is always to use straight lines on walls if it makes sense. Sometimes it's not the best idea because it actually hides the lines that define our building or our subject. There are no hard and fast rules in hatching. It's what works in this scene with the line work of the drawing that you've already applied. See here I use vertical lines for the shade on this side of the tower. I think it probably works better here than here. Possibly I went too dark here, but what did work well was putting lines in a different direction for all the inset of the wall of the window here, matching these windows here. In this approach, that recess was just flattened into almost non-existence. And in this one, we lose the sense of direction that it is. It could just be a strip that we're facing straight on. The line work doesn't give us any clue that this actually goes a different direction to the wall on each side. Whereas by changing the direction of our line work so dramatically, it does convey that. However, I actually don't think it works so well here on this buttress. It's too much of a contrast. Plus, it reads as if it somehow connects with this window set into the wall, which it doesn't. This is actually an object coming out from the wall, not a space going into the wall. If I were doing this again, I would get a darker effect here the same way I did here by doing vertical lines and then by doing some more lines over the top, cross hatching at an angle that wasn't too much off the vertical so that the overall effect was still a vertical feel rather than a diagonal feel. And this is a great example of the difference between shade and shadow Shade is where the light can't reach part of an object. So with the sun coming this way, the sunlight can't reach this wall. It can't reach this wall because these parts of the building are turned away from the light. Therefore, these parts of the building are in shade. However, this part here of this tower is not turned away from the light. It should receive light, except that this part of the structure is blocking the light from reaching this part. This part of the building is casting a shadow onto this wall. And shadow is darker than shade. And if we look at our reference photo here, we can see that this shadow is actually a darker tone than this shade. And when we look at our buttress here, it's in shadow because this tower is blocking the light from reaching it. Therefore, it's a darker value than the wall of the tower that's in shade. Learning to see how this pattern works is very helpful when we do our line work because if I know that shadow is darker than shade and I can see that I have an area of shadow, then I need to vary my line work in some way between shade and shadow to reflect that. The other important thing about shade and shadow, if we're working in color, is that the undertones of shadow are cool and the undertones of shade are warm. The other thing we can use line work for and hatching for is not just to do with shade or shadow but to do with color. We can suggest color differences and so I use the line work in the tiles to reflect the fact that they're a darker color than the stonework. And I also decided to reflect these very dark reflected shapes in these front two windows on both sides and it was only when I was doing this one second that I realized that it was also hiding this line I drew by mistake and I thought this reinforces the point I often make 
don't sweat with mistakes when you make them because often there are unexpected ways you can hide the error before you get to the end of the drawing. So which approach do you use when you do hatching and cross hatching? Does one of these three examples match up your technique? Or do you do a combination of all three? Or do you do something quite different? Let's just look at them side by side. To be honest, I think there are problems with each of them, including my one at the end, which is often the way hatching works. And once we've finished a drawing, it's always good to look at things like our line work and think, what has worked well? What will I do different next time? As I explained with how I would cross hatch this buttress if I were doing it again. But I think overall, this third example lets us feel the three-dimensional shape of the building a lot more successfully than these first two examples. My general principle is let line work follow the shape of the object that it's in in some way, but let line work also reflect the perspective angles of that section of the building, as I explained with these windows. So there are some things for you to think about next time you cross hatch. The important thing is to be adventurous with our line work because that's the way we learn and that's the way we end up evolving the technique that becomes the one that we favor, that we in fact draw naturally without thinking. And that's part of the development of our own individual drawing style. So get out there and cross hatch. Don't be shy. Have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.